Star Kids Solar System Exploration Written by John Harrington Narrated by Stephanie Quinn Chapter 1 Solar System Exploration Zooming through the universe faster than the speed of light on their flying scooters and skateboards, these five boys, Zeus, Ares, Uranus, Hermes, Poseidon, five girls, Gia, Aphrodite, Selene, Cronus, Hades, and a male Dalmatian puppy named Helios wasted no time flying to their destination. Led by Zeus and Gia, these other very curious astronomy students wondered why they were on this so-called very important mission. I just hope this place has a skateboard park, Ares desired very vainly as he flew on his skateboard. And I'm wishing that my hair doesn't get messed up, Aphrodite added arrogantly while also flying on her skateboard. I think we should all turn back now while we still can. Uranus complained pessimistically. Yeah, there could be scary monsters and violent forces of nature out there. Selene continued with much gloom. Well, I'm just glad to be getting all this exercise on my pedal-powered scooter, Hermes strongly boasted. Yeah, me too. Being out here in outer space is better than staying indoors too often, Cronus added while pedaling her scooter also to keep in shape. Perhaps this assignment shall be very educational, Poseidon remarked intellectually. Positively, Hades concurred. Also, this odyssey will include something astronomically significant. Roo, roo. Helio sparked consensually as to agree with everybody. Concluding their statements, this fifth grade astronomy class resumed their flight. Gazing all around, they enjoyed the wide variety of the multicolored nebula, space clouds, stars, galaxies, and all the other objects this Milky Way galaxy has to offer. Always heading 180 degrees south, these 11-year-old students finally entered our one-and-a-half-billion-year-old solar system. Not having to eat or sleep, these star kids would have much more time for their solar system exploration. Using our sun as a guide, which was still hundreds of millions of miles away, Zeus continued to escort this group on his projected straight course. After traveling for many hours from their home star named Polaris, these Polarisians finally arrived at and landed on our North Pole. So after gathering around, Zeus and Gia explained to everyone why they were all brought way out here. Okay, everybody, please listen up. Zeus instructed. With permission from our leader, principal, and all our parents, Gia and I thought it would be a good idea to bring you all out here. This will help you all to understand astronomy more and to do better in that school class. Zeus divulged while grabbing these pupils' attention. Zeus and I accidentally discovered this solar system last month, then visited it last week. It contains a central burning star, nine planets, at least 115 moons, many asteroids, comets, and meteors. Gia added very informatively. Now to teach you about this place in a fun way, everyone will be participating in a scavenger hunt. Gia and I hit flags on many objects in this part of the Milky Way galaxy. Each flag is numbered either 5, 10, 15, 20, or 25. Every number will be one point. The higher the numbered flag is, the more difficult it will be to find. The person with the flags totaling the most points will be the winner, Zeus explained. Finally, Zeus or I will email you all a four-line set of instructions in poetic form to your vehicle's computer on where to find each flag, sent one at a time. Gia revealed. Okay, so if everybody would line up side by side, we will get ready to start this challenge. Zeus concluded. To give all these contestants the same fair advantage, Zeus and Gia adjusted all of these players' vehicles to not exceed the speed of light, which is 186,282 miles per second. Getting ready, these opponents were about to start this game. Being the only one equipped with a UPS, Universal Positioning System, 
On his scooter's dashboard computer, Zeus could locate anyone's vehicle anywhere in the universe. As a practice run, they would first be sent out near our sun. With no flags there, these contenders would just have to recharge their vehicle's batteries. Getting all excited, these rivals received their first set of instructions. So after reading these instructions, they all paused for a while, giving it a second thought. Without further ado, being the most intellectual members of the octet, Poseidon and Hades took off first, with the remainder soon to follow. Beginning this game, these young, daring astronauts begin their maiden voyage on their own. Little did they know, they would soon encounter very violent forces of nature with extremely high and low temperatures. Also, volcanoes, orbiting objects, and near collisions. Chapter 2 Hydrogenous Solar Sun Firestorm Now heading towards this glowing gaseous day star sun, the remaining hopeful soon followed. Not having to wear sunglasses, these aspirants could stare at this sun without hurting their eyes. Flying in single file in the back of the line for just a few minutes, Ares and Aphrodite got bored, then started zigzagging cutting everybody off to proceed to the front of the line while ignoring the other's verbal warnings on how dangerous it was. This daring couple continued their reckless ways. Not paying much attention, Ares accidentally sideswiped Aphrodite, taking the lead. Panicking very much, Aphrodite was knocked out of control and became hysterical. Frozen in horror, her whole body became very tense. With her hand turning the accelerator all the way, she headed directly towards the sun's corona surface. Very quickly, her friends had to devise a plan to rescue her. Turn away from that star now, Aphrodite! Ares shouted as he flew closer to help her. Hades, please text Zeus or Gia and explain to them this dreadful situation! Poseidon yelled as he tried flying closer. Okay, I'll email them immediately about this dire consequence. Hades answered loudly to Poseidon. Come on, Cronus, let's spring into action and physically push her out of the path of destruction. Hermes voiced bravely to her as this energetic duo raced into action. Okay, I'll try to grab her and steer her away from the star. Cronus revealed as she tried to reach her, but couldn't. Hold on, Aphrodite. I'll try to deflect you at a 45-degree angle. Hades informed her as she tried unsuccessfully to fly parallel to her. I'll ride adjacent to her and disengage the power system by disabling the terminals. Poseidon notified Hades before also failing. This is too scary. Let's fly back. Uranus alerted Selene as they both cowardly started to fly back to Earth. I'm right behind you. I know we shouldn't have come on this trip. Selene dissuaded Uranus as she frighteningly followed him. Ruff, 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 ruff. Helios barked with much warning as he looked back at the action while riding on Uranus's scooter's handlebars. Continuing their escape, they coincidentally met up with Zeus and Gia. Asking for the location of these troubled ones, this unwilling couple reluctantly escorted their leaders. After arriving to the chaos within minutes, these two bosses officially took charge. Come on, everybody, let's all rescue Aphrodite, Zeus ordered. Yes, let's all get into position and help her, Gia advised them very calmly. Uranus, please fly close to Hades, then have Helios jump on her handlebars to try to save Aphrodite. Zeus kindly instructed as Uranus intensely quivered but obliged grudgingly. Yes, maybe Helios could gently grab her shirt collar with his paw's claws and pull her away from the star, Gia figured. Sure, me and Helios will do it now. Uranus complied very anxiously, then sped up, making the transaction. Okay, Helios, we're close to her. Gently grab onto her collar now. Hades ordered Helios, but with no luck. So as everybody flew closer to the sun, it got hotter and hotter. All of a sudden, a hellishly fiery flame came roaring towards them. Very quickly, everyone swerved out of the way. Then while they all stared at her in horror, Aphrodite was heading right towards this large eruption. 
known as a solar flare. With everybody else petrified of this hydrogenous solar firestorm, Hades devised a plan in her head. Immediately taking off, she vigorously veered around the flames and got closer to the rescue. With all shouting at Aphrodite to turn out of harm's way, she just couldn't bring herself to do so. As she soared through the fire, they all thought the unthinkable just occurred, then started screaming. Very fortunately for Aphrodite, because its molecules are very far apart, the flames won't burn anyone. Still in grave danger, she was still heading towards the sun's corona surface. With her plan still in effect, Hades and Helios finally pulled up next to Aphrodite. Helios, lean far to the left and gently bite down on Aphrodite's suit collar. Then pull her right to steer her out of danger. Do it right now, please, Hades demanded politely. Obeying her command on cue, this dauntless man's best friend tilted westward. Trying to grasp onto Aphrodite's apparel with his teeth, Helios just couldn't grip it. Losing precious time, this massive 865,000-mile-wide burning sphere appeared to be getting larger and larger. Hurry, Helios, this is our last chance! Hades wept loudly. So, as the others still watched in horror, he leaned a little more and clamped down on her collar. Biting down, using all his strength, Helios finally pulled Aphrodite away. Just as soon as Aphrodite was secured, Hades made a hard right to avoid a collision with this yellow dwarf star. Barely missing this, she would have flown through its corona, chromosphere, photosphere, convection zone, radioactive zone, then hit its 27 million degree core, and then would have disintegrated. Right after watching this very chilling and heroic rescue from afar, these spectators burst into very loud, cheerful cries of joy. Returning to reunite with their schoolmates, they all took turns carrying and parading this brave dog while clapping and cheering excessively. Ending this very long celebration, all these partygoers lined up side by side, facing the sun from a million miles away. With their original intention, it took only a few minutes to recharge their vehicle's batteries. Watching in amazement, they were all stunned by its dark circular areas. Known as sunspots, their average sizes are twice that of Earth. Visible to observe, they disappear after about two months. While everybody else was gazing at this astronomical phenomenon, by calculating the speed of these sunspots, Poseidon and Hades determined that our sun's equator spins at about 4,500 miles per hour and takes 25 and a half days to rotate. Very soon after these two intellects showed off their sophisticated equation, Zeus and Gia flew back to headquarters and sent them their next set of instructions. Chapter 3 Cratered Mercurian Mercury Meteor Shower Finishing reading this poem, they all decided to fly in single file and not to swerve or pass anyone because of past reckless behavior. Leading the way, Poseidon cautioned everyone to look around for anything dangerous and to be vigilant, especially by spotting this first planet from the sun. Meanwhile, like being fired from a cannon, a charcoal gray iron cannonball-like planet was traveling at 107,000 miles per hour. Heading in the opposite direction, these unsuspecting flyers were on a collision course. Barely swerving out of its way, they all crash-landed onto the solar system's dullest and fasted orbiting planet while still on their vehicles. After viewing this horrific cosmic mishap in disbelief on his computer, Zeus and Gia very carefully guided them through email to a place to gather around. Of this fossil planet's 1,761 named features, Zeus chose the largest one, named Calaris Basin. Arriving at this 963-mile-wide crater, they all checked to see that no one was injured. So without further ado, lining up side by side, everybody quickly got ready for this fierce competition to officially begin. 
revving up their motors and looking side to side at each other with great determination. They all were getting prepared to finally start this aggressive game. Staring at their onboard computers, they read their next instructions. Just as soon as these instructions were understood, all the challengers sped off simultaneously. With their adrenaline flowing very fast, no one took regards to anyone else's personal safety. Bumping into and cutting each other off, this aggressive hunt finally got underway. Do follow close behind me, then execute a hard right turn at 45 degrees with me, Hades. Poseidon directed precisely. Please try to pedal faster to keep up with me, Cronus. It isn't too much further, Hermes advised, while working up a sweat, keeping in shape. Excuse me. So sorry. Coming through. Ares and Aphrodite apologized as they were up to their old tricks again by swerving and passing everyone to get in the lead. So, after their short but vigorous race, everyone arrived at this massive hole known as Beethoven Crater. At 150 miles wide and extremely deep, they were all very amazed by the sight of our solar system's largest crater. Soon then, hastily exiting their vehicles and scattering in all different directions, they tried to look for the flag and win their first points. With a white flag against an almost black background, it was quickly spotted. There it is! Ares carelessly shouted while thinking out loudly, which he realized he shouldn't have done. You might as well stay down here, Ares. I'm going to capture the flag. Aphrodite snickered as she ran up the all-dark gray bumpy rock trail towards it. Not a chance, Aphrodite! Ares sneaked as he ran closely behind her, trying to pass. I'm staying down here. That loose terrain looks too unstable. Selene trembled. I'm staying here also. Uranus cowered. They might start a landslide. I shall pursue this lower inclined path instead to accelerate at a greater velocity. Poseidon calculated as Hades understood this theory and followed hoping to eventually take the lead. You should stay down here, Kronos. It'll be much too tiring for you. Hermes advocated, then exercised great strength and agility by running and climbing over the rocks. Not a chance, Hermes. I am very fit for this physical challenge, Kronos declared as she always kept up, running just behind him while proving her great athleticism. Reaching and grabbing this flag first because of this great agility, Hermes started running down to show it off. Not watching where he was going, he stumbled over a rock and the flag flew out of his hand. Being grabbed by everyone, then slipping through their hands, Hermes managed to re-grip it extremely tight this time, then claimed to be this game's first victor. Receiving only a measly five points. This defeater couldn't help but grin and celebrate, while the rest became frustrated and very disappointed with their loss. Still rejoicing over his triumph, this champion emailed his guides about his achievement. Swiftly praising him, Zeus promptly sent them the next verse. Determined to win this next fierce battle-like challenge again, it was Hermes' moment to exert all of his stamina into his pedaling ability, which gave him the lead. Never looking back, this jock concentrated 100% on his hunch of where this next one was hidden. Sensing his vibe, the rest of his friends were flying very close behind. Soon after, these racers reached famous roops. In total amazement of this intriguing mercurial Mercurian landscape, all these observers viewed these astonishing yet scary-looking and treacherous, steep, dangerous cliffs. While still keeping their eyes on this remarkable panorama, they all knew they had to exit their vehicles and hike up these narrow and hilly paths because their vehicles wouldn't be agile enough. Jumping off them, they all darted up a steep, rocky path at full speed. Running their fastest! They had to stay in single file on this very narrow, winding, and impassable passageway. Not too concerned with their own personal safety, one small slip off this hundreds of feet high cliff 
would certainly lead to a tragic end. So after all this running up the cliff, Cronus instinctively stopped. Catching on to her suspicion, the rest also paused to observe her every action. Suddenly, with a serendipitous look on her face, this very excited one saw, then ran after it. With everyone else realizing this, they all ran behind her. Uncleverly diving for this flag, Cronus gripped, but it unfortunately slipped away. Not having quick enough reflexes, Poseidon didn't have time to grasp this fast-flying flag. Between people trying to grab onto it and its ricocheting off this roops' walls, it was virtually impossible to capture. Flying towards the edge of the cliff, this flag would soon disappear. Ignoring her own safety, Cronus lunged towards it. Joining in the action, Hermes ran right behind her. Then very suddenly, after slipping off the side, Cronus miraculously managed to catch its edge. Screaming for help, Hermes instinctively ran to her aid instead of capturing the flag. Taking advantage of this dire situation, Ares calmly snatched the flag reluctantly, giving him the win based on a technicality. Without cheering for his own victory, he, like everyone else, rushed over to give Hermes moral support by attempting to rescue Cronus. So as soon as Cronus's hand lost grip of the stony side, Hermes instantly locked onto it in the nick of time. While still in the lying position, using all his strength, this hero swung her back and forth in a perpendicular motion. After a few swings, this lifesaver was able to pull her back onto the ledge to safety. With a short round of applause from the onlookers, then with her own sigh of relief, everyone comforted her silently, for they all realized how dangerous this turned out to be. Worrying how the rest of this game may turn out, their fears soon grew larger. Waiting very patiently for their next set, they finally arrived. So, after this message was read, once again, Hermes was the first to take off with everyone else in hot pursuit. Putting his navigational skills to the test, this double winner was the first to reach their destination. Within a couple of more minutes, everyone else arrived at this eerie place named Borealis Planitia. Seeing for miles, they scanned this flat plain in every direction. Viewing the sun as instructed, they were all determined to know which way to go, then started their hunt. Okay, you all could stay here. I'm going to be the only one to find this flag. Ares giggled, half-jokingly, as everyone else laughed, knowing he was only kidding. No way, this one's mine, Cronus guaranteed with great determination. I have abstractly calculated the precise location of this flag. Hades expressed as everyone else started to follow her trustingly. According to my calculations, this should be the exact location. Poseidon accounted for as he stopped while everyone else gathered around. Looking very perplexed, they all scanned 360 degrees repeatedly over this totally charcoal gray colored plane for this hidden flag. With an erratic look on her face, letting out a loud gasp, Cronus detected it only a few hundred feet away, then quickly sped towards it. Catching on to her sudden departure, the remainder soon took chase in this precarious race. Pedaling so hard with all her mighty strength, Cronus took the lead. Finally approaching its location, she reached down and grasped this very sought-after flag. Raising and waving it all around wildly, this champion celebrated with a quick victorious dance. Expressing long, agonizing moans, the others painfully awaited the next challenge. Still waiting impatiently, Zeus and Gia finally released the next instructions. Before anyone registered any ideas where to look, they experienced quite a shock. Wow, a small rock almost just hit me. Selene informed all with much concern. Me too, Aphrodite also heeded. Look, a, a bunch of rocks are falling out of the atmosphere all around us, 
Uranus warned grimly. Very quickly, let's all enter this cave on our vehicles immediately, Hermes shouted at the top of his lungs. Brushing in it very rapidly, they were all very fortunate to avoid this cratered Mercurian meteor shower. Traveling at 50,000 miles per hour, these meteorites came crashing onto this cave. Temporarily acting as a bomb shelter, its roof and walls began to explode and cave in. Very petrified, these brave souls huddled around each other, trembling uncontrollably. While everyone else was panicking, Hermes quickly sent out a mayday to Zeus and Gia via email. Quickly after receiving this dire message from Hermes's computer, this gallant duo flew off immediately for this daring rescue attempt. Meanwhile, back at this crumbling cave, these innocent victims were still huddled around each other and frozen in horror. Using his UPS, Zeus and Gia arrived at this warlike zone within a few minutes. Hearing their cries for help, this brave duo pinpointed the cave. With the meteorite still pouring down madly, and because of an avalanche blocking its northern entrance, these rescuers had to find another option. Thinking up a plan, Gia convinced Zeus that they should find an opening on the southern side of this cave. Determining the best approach, these searchers found a back entrance. Hearing their yells for assistance, this obligated pair finally reached them. Still in harm's way, they knew that they had to act fast, for the walls came tumbling down. Ordering everyone to follow them out immediately, Zeus and Gia led the way back out the southern exit. With the ground shaking more violently and the walls and roof falling, they all hopped on their vehicles and started heading out. Flying as fast as they could, all their vehicles were scraping and bouncing off these winding and narrow bouldered passages, while this gigantic cave was disintegrating behind them. Almost being buried alive, they all just barely made it out. Still in danger, they had to avoid this meteorological rocky bombardment, which grew larger and larger, seeming to follow them. Then hastily, while everyone was flying up at a 45-degree angle very fast, they all were pelted with this storm's meteoric debris. Conclusively, flying away at a safe distance outside Mercury's atmosphere, they all stopped to view this dwelling upon what this near-tragic event could have been like. Narrowly escaping with their lives with only minor scrapes and bruises, these petrified survivors were extremely fortunate to make it out alive. Not sweating the small stuff, no one gave any concern to the minor dents and scratches marked on their vehicles. Proceeding back to base, these two leaders, after much heated debate, mutually agreed to resume this exceedingly dangerous and highly controversial game. Chapter 4 Volcanic Venusian Venus Eruption Flying back to their base, the two directors naturally resumed their duty by emailing them their next instructions. Just as soon as this information was read, they all took off towards this second planet from the sun in their usual reckless ways. Seen from Earth, this brightest planet was always in view. Entering Venus's northern hemisphere, named Artemis, they all arrived at the Mead Crater. At 174 miles wide, this planet's largest crater was easy to spot. Landing inside this massive hole on one of its rings, they all congregated. I think it's up this way, Hermes said as he jumped off his scooter and ran up a path of scree, or broken rock, with Cronus following. My, My estimation, estimation would, would be, be to navigate, navigate up this, this elevation of 45 degrees, Hades and Poseidon simultaneously stated as they both headed in that direction. I'm going up this way. Selene trembled while only walking carefully, using extreme caution. Yeah, let me follow you, Selene. Uranus cowered, then followed reluctantly. Why aren't you participating in this competition, Aphrodite? Poseidon inquired with great concern. 
I'm just getting bored. This doesn't interest me at all. Aphrodite explained vainly as she brushed her hair while looking in her pocket mirror. Well, we all have to physically perform and get sweaty sometimes, Hermes affirmed while exerting his task. And we also have to get very dirty and perspire often, Cronus complained while copying Hermes' activity. Now these sometimes include constant abstract calculations and determinations, Hades supplemented. You must also stimulate your intelligence by always rationalizing. Poseidon resolved accurately. Sometimes we put down our vanity and do undesirable things, Hermes kindly advised Aphrodite. But she could get so messed up and ruin her appearance and clothes. Selene frowned despairingly as to defend her colleague. Yeah, also she could fall and become injured with cuts and bruises. Uranus gloomed hopelessly as all the others quietly disagreed with this bleak couple. Yes, physical fitness is very important to our health. It does make us perspire a lot, but that's a good thing, Cronus proudly added. Fortunately, in the long run, it definitely pays off, Hermes concluded very caringly. Quickly afterwards, this very competitive search resumed. So, after allowing their good advice to sink in for a while, Aphrodite thought it over for a minute, then decided to participate. After mentally going over everything she learned so far about Venus, especially about Artemis, she got down and dirty, giving it her all. After the extensive and messy searching, Aphrodite's hard work finally paid off, for she was the winner of this phase of the competition. Jumping up and down repeatedly, this excited first-time winner cheered out loudly. As the non-winners respectfully applauded her victory, Aphrodite's confidence skyrocketed, making her a willing challenger for the remainder of this tournament. Wow, that was very extraordinary how you determined its precision location, Aphrodite, Poseidon admitted openly. Yes, you also use some of your endurance to run fast, Cronus stated impressively. You also did it so awesomely, Ares gloated suavely. Very brave, also. I definitely would have panicked, Selene disclosed nervously. Me too, Uranus quickly conceded. Physicality definitely played a role in your achievement. Hermes praised her happily. Congratulations on your exceptional discovery. Hades professed with much admiration. Well, thank you for all those wonderful compliments. Aphrodite blushed as she thought she would put down her vain act and try much harder from now on. Contacting Zeus and Gia shortly after their mini merriment ended, their next instructions came. Being on a winning streak... Aphrodite kept up her confident attitude and continued trying extra hard while resuming this game. Spinning at only 4 miles per hour at its equator and heating up to 950 degrees Fahrenheit, this slowest rotating and hottest planet made this a long, hot Venerian Venusian day. Gathering up every bit of information and experiences she learned so far from this solar system, Aphrodite gave it her all by actually getting down and dirty. At about a mile away, they all gazed at the site of a huge volcano. Inactive for now, this huge cone-shaped open smoking top mountain-like formation seemed very unpredictable. Getting very excited about this, the clues to find the flag drew them closer to this 5,500-foot tall massive landscape. Having to exit their vehicles, they happily ran 45 degrees up the base of this humongous hill. Now knowing that the prize was purposely hidden on it, as a joke, they all thought it very humorous and laughed to themselves as they climbed higher and higher, approaching its mouth. Hearing a series of booming explosions as this massive stone structure shook in sync, all their hearts beat fast and uncontrollably. Then, suddenly, 
with hot, boiling, liquid orange lava flowing over the top and racing down the sides, spewing in every direction. They all froze in terror because they had never seen anything like it before. Staying motionless due to horror, they witnessed a Venusian volcanic eruption. Watching this very thick gel oozing down towards them, the flag's white color reflected off this lava's glow-in-the-dark color, even though it was still daytime. Running towards it, Aphrodite made a bold dash, dangerously approaching, then grabbing it. This careless one had no regards for her own personal safety, foolishly putting her life on the line. Beating her to it, the merciless 2,000-degree lava devoured, then disintegrated the prize-winning flag into ashes. Then, shockingly, after witnessing this horrific event, Aphrodite wisely took off immediately. With everyone else still immobile from the shock of this Cytherian Venusian lava, Aphrodite unentranced them by yelling to leave now. Immediately snapping out of it just in time, they all raced behind her. Knowing that she was in charge, this fearless leader couldn't make any mistakes in this life-saving downhill foot race. Literally feeling the heat getting closer and closer, this heroine knew she had to change course. Veering a hard left, all the others quickly followed. Seeing light through a tunnel, she knew it would be a tragic mistake for them to take cover in because the lava would seep through. Running by another cave and not seeing any light seeping through, she screamed for everyone to run inside its further lower entrance. Just in time, they all jumped inside, barely saving themselves from this fast-flowing river of fire. Because this small tunnel where everyone huddled inside only had an entrance in the front and was tilting forward, the lava flowed over and around it. Still in harm's way and panicking more than ever, they all wanted to leave. Becoming very delirious, they all couldn't think straight and feared the end was near. Keeping her composure and still in the take charge mode, Aphrodite frantically tried to send out an SOS via email to Zeus and Gia. Trying everyone's computer with no luck due to the interference from the covering lava, she kept on trying over and over, repeatedly by typing, help. Waiting and waiting in this unbearably sweltering heat brought on by this lava, they were all convinced that this rescue mission would be doomed. Clueless of their perilous situation, Zeus and Gia were a little concerned why they haven't heard from them lately. Due to the thick lava covering over their computer signals, this worried couple finally received the SOS a few minutes after it was sent. Taking this very seriously, such as a 911 emergency call, Zeus and Gia barely deciphered this frantic, staticky, broken-up message, then very quickly sprung into action. So with further ado, using their UPS, they headed right to the danger zone. Quickly reaching this havocing scene, Zeus and Gia soon witnessed how dreadful the situation really was. Keeping their distance from this molten stream, they knew this was one of the hottest and most toxic substances in this entire solar system. Letting their presence be known via computer, these rescuees were extremely relieved, but knew they had to stay cool, calm, and collected. Assessing the situation for a while, Zeus told Gia that he would first have to find a spot where the lava wasn't flowing over the cave's entrance. Explaining that he may have to rescue them one at a time, she would have to check if they would be fine once rescued. After Gia agreed to this, Zeus found a safe area and rushed right in. Rescuing these petrified victims one by one, they all turned out to be unhurt, and these survivors were thankful to be alive. Sprinting very fast down this mountain on another path that had no flowing lava, they all hopped on their vehicles, flying away as soon as possible, heading in all different directions. They were just glad to get off this most dangerous by far planet. Ordering everyone to muster around, thousands of miles away in mid-air on their vehicles, 
Zeus told them all that he will have a very important message for them all, then led the way back towards headquarters. While flying back in single file, Zeus had a private whispered conversation with Gia about what this meeting will be about, explaining to her that this scavenger hunt is way too dangerous and probably should be canceled immediately, he asked her to opine. So after a quick thought, she agreed with him, then both decided that this game is much too dangerous and will end right away, and we'll all fly back home together at once. Patiently awaiting, all these curious contestants wondered what this so-called discussion would be about. Chapter 5 Aquatic Earthly Earth Tsunami Deeply contemplating on what to say at their meeting, Zeus and Gia indirectly drifted off course, with no one else realizing. Then, all of a sudden, screeching along, Halley's Comet flew straight towards them at approximately 160,000 miles per hour. Trailing the pack and looking all around while admiring our solar system as usual, Aphrodite was the only one to see it. Screaming at the top of her lungs for everyone to watch out, they all instinctively veered out of the way ASAP. Just like a guided missile, this 220 trillion pound fire and ice projectile hit its target. Barely sideswiping everyone, this massive rock spun them all out of control in different directions. Losing control, Zeus quickly headed towards Jupiter. Crash landing on its largest moon, Ganymede, this worried leader walked around and shook off the pain. Feeling extremely embarrassed and very guilty, this failed chaperone knew that he can be in serious trouble if he didn't safely rescue them all as soon as possible. Knowing that this is the climactic turning point of this exploration, this petrified mastermind knew he had to think quick and come up with a plan really fast. Now turning into a search and rescue mission, he knew he had to set up a new headquarters right there and now. Damaged by his crash landing, his scooter didn't function at all. Not knowing how long it would take to fix, he knew it was imperative to contact his colleague Gia right away. Emailing being his only option, he sent out many to her from his vehicle's equipped handlebar computer. Due to his damaging situation and its sometimes solar interference, their computer signals sometimes get delayed. Meanwhile, as everyone else was bumped off course, Gia, Aphrodite, Uranus, and Ares were headed towards Earth. With this third planet racing around the sun at about 66,500 miles per hour, they approached the atmosphere of this third planet from the sun, entering its top layer known as the exosphere. These four were still out of control. Traveling eastward, they indirectly circumnavigated our almost 25,000-mile-long equator. Whoa, uh, hold on, Uranus! Aphrodite bellowed as they continued to spin and roll. I I'm trying to... Uranus shouted with not much confidence. Steadily losing speed due to friction, they also slowly lost altitude. Descending lower into the ionosphere, thermosphere, mesosphere, stratosphere, then into the troposphere, they finally ascended down to the ozone layer. Entering Asia, the largest continent by area, Aphrodite headed towards the Himalayan mountain range. Luckily, traveling at only 30 miles per hour, she roughly landed onto this snow-capped peak, which absorbed the impact. Still out of control and sliding on her skateboard, this petrified girl rolled down the snow and ice-filled 29,029-foot hill named Mount Everest. Still screaming while skiing down, her echoes and vibrations triggered a huge avalanche. Trying to hydroplane faster on this frozen surface, this massive white powdered wave was gaining speed. Quickly, grab my hand! Gia screamed. Got it! Aphrodite screamed back just as Gia pulled her away in time as this white wall of death came crashing down beside them. Still sliding down, they had the pleasure of viewing the snow geese, snow leopards, goats, woodchucks, black bears, 
and all the beautiful flora from its majestic scenery. Finally reaching its base and gaining control, they both stopped, laid on their backs in the snow, then gave out a big sigh of relief. Wow! What an exciting adventure that was! Gia laughed hysterically. I know, it sure was. <laughs> Aphrodite giggled hard also as she brushed her hair. Suddenly receiving an urgent email on her vehicle's computer, which is alerted by an audible chime, Gia knew it was a dire message from Zeus. Rushing over to read it, this email basically mentioned that she must find everyone else with his guidance and that he is unable to physically search with her due to being stranded. Traveling in a westward direction for 3,400 miles, they approach this 12 million square miles second largest area continent, currently known as Africa. Narrowing down on their coordinates, they entered its northern half at the Sahara Desert, just as a furious sandstorm developed. With the winds picking up speeds to over 50 miles per hour, these two girls had to think very quickly. Having no other choice, they made an emergency landing on a telluric, earthly sand dune. Aphrodite, turn backwards and cover your face to protect it against the storm, Gia commanded firmly. Okay, will do, Aphrodite abided, yelling back necessarily due to the howling winds. Zeus's email directions on my computer showed that Uranus should be straight ahead one mile. We must walk instead through the storm to find him, Gia instructed her. Sure, no problem, Aphrodite optimized as they both very carefully descended on foot down this desert's largest dune of over 600 feet. After carefully walking half a mile, this blinding storm finally faded. Now approaching the treacherous 4,100-mile Nile River, they were stunned. Wow, look at that, Gia said amazingly while pointing at its salt water. I'm amazed. Is it some kind of liquid? Aphrodite quivered, for that was the first time they've ever seen this type of liquid. Whoa, Aphrodite, swim faster! A beast is chasing us! Gia screamed horrifyingly as this beastly crocodile paddled closer. Help me, Gia! I can't swim any faster! Aphrodite frantically yelled, maybe uttering her last words, as this amphibious, carnivorous reptile locked its jaws, dragging her below this aquatic surface. With no hope in sight, suddenly its natural foe came to her rescue by nudging this 16-foot, 1,000-pound aggressor, releasing its meal. Floating back to the surface, her mate quickly revived her with CPR. Pursuing its natural enemy, a hippopotamus chased the beast away. Moving along, they resumed their search on this three and a half million square mile, very arid, sandy desert. Indirectly viewing the dromedaries, camels, goats, foxes, antelopes, cheetahs, monitor lizards, hyraxes, sandpipers, dogs, and ostriches. They were amazed at these creatures' different shapes, sizes, abilities, and colors. Oh my, what beautiful creatures! Gia expressed excitingly as they slowly walked their mission. Yes, they certainly are, Aphrodite happily agreed. With the mercury rising to its maximum of 120 degrees Fahrenheit, they both decided to rest on an oasis. Phew, I don't look so good after all we've been through, Aphrodite vainly complained. Yeah, I'm tired also. Hopefully Uranus is close by, Gia added. Watch out, Aphrodite! There's a small creature crawling up your arm, Gia suddenly warned. Oh no! Aphrodite yelled back as she quickly brushed off a death stalker scorpion right before a possible fatal sting. Once again, very petrified, this duo sprinted away as fast as possible. Very fortunate for Uranus, he saw them running towards his direction. Girls, help me! Uranus shouted as he slowly sank more and more. Hold on, Uranus! 
Gia hollered as she and Aphrodite rushed over, assessing the situation. Aphrodite, lay down on your stomach next to me and give me your hand, Gia requested as they locked a hand each, making a human chain. Okay, now grab Uranus's hand, Gia added as Aphrodite gripped the entire, losing grip of one finger at a time until coming down to the last finger. Oh, hold on tight, Aphrodite! Uranus whimpered as he held on for dear life as this unforgiving desert sand continued swallowing him up. I'll just pull myself up, Uranus said as his last finger lost grip, grabbing her arm with his other hand while pulling himself to safety. Whew! <sighs> they all shouted while laying on their backs, letting out a big sigh of relief. After emailing Zeus a little after this heroic rescue, he sent Gia instructions for their next rescue. Flying true south at 180 degrees, this trio soared off to find Ares. Heading towards the South Pole, 9,000 miles away, approaching their new destination, they flew into a fierce windstorm. Everyone hold on tight! It is very windy! Gia shouted nervously as they braved this 200 mile per hour windstorm. Whoa, I'm losing control! Aphrodite quivered as she descended very rapidly. I don't think I can handle it, Uranus mentioned doubtfully. Fighting this losing battle, these three all of a sudden crash landed on an iceberg at a high rate of speed. Running out of space, they slid off this terrestrial earthly ice field and into the freezing Antarctic Ocean. Filled with killer whales, these mammals chased them. Reliving a nightmarish terror, these three swam for dear life. Making it to shore with their vehicles in tow, they frantically caught their breaths, escaping another death-defying event. Oh, that was too close! Aphrodite complained hysterically as she quickly tried to groom herself. I know, but just as long as we all made it to shore safely, Gia mentioned positively. Wow, this place is so barren. Looks like we're in the middle of nowhere. Uranus griped as they all looked at this icy and snowy territory for as long as the eye could see. Taking a quick recess, they then flew very low over this continent. Having difficulty judging height due to the covered snow, known as whiteout, they had to look for Ares. Approaching his estimated whereabouts, they spotted him in the icy waters. Found unconscious and laying on top, his skateboard acted as a life-saving flotation device. Pulling him out safely on land, they all brought him back to consciousness. Wow, I must have been knocked out after my unsafe approach, Ares mentioned, unscathed. Well, we're all just glad that you are all right, Gia admitted as everyone else agreed. Following proper procedure, once again, Gia sent Zeus the good news proclaiming another successful rescue. So then, immediately being summoned to the North Pole by their male leader, these four immediately departed our world's largest desert. While taking off for their next destination, Gia was the only one to feel a slight tremor. Thinking nothing of it, she resumed her lead. While looking back at the seals, penguins, and giant snow petrel birds, they were all amazed with these habitant creatures. Not paying attention due to sightseeing, they almost ran into Vincent Massif. At 16,000 feet, this continent's largest mountain is Earth's third highest point. Thinking nothing of this close encounter, they all resumed their journey as usual. En route to the North Pole, Ares unexpectedly developed mechanical trouble. Uh-oh, I think I'm having a slight problem, Ares mentioned as his skateboard intermittently sputtered. Okay, let's find a place to land so we can take a look at it, Gia ordered as they all slowed down looking for land. Having already flown 7,500 miles from Antarctica, Hawaii seemed to be nonviolent, so Gia instructed everyone to follow her for an emergency landing on this paradisical archipelago. Selecting its largest island, also named Hawaii, they all touched down on its 4,000 square mile surface. 
I think I just have to adjust something on my skateboard to fix it, Aries admitted, feeling a little guilty. Wow, look at those beautiful winged creatures, Aphrodite mentioned with amazement as she pointed to some of the multi-vibrant colored tropical parrots, macaws, and parakeets. Oh yes, and so aren't they. Gia added by also pointing at the exotic ducks, geese, swan, turkeys, partridges, quail, albatrosses, hawks, eagles, doves, owls, and other native birds. I hope they don't attack by pecking and clawing at us. Urino shivered cowardly, as usual. I am going to tour these islands for a few minutes. Can everyone just wait here and help Ares repair? Gia asked. As they all unanimously agreed, she thought it would be fun to use Aphrodite's skateboard for the first time as a change. Circling around the six other main islands, she quickly observed Oahu, Kauai, Keho, Alawi, and Lanai. Deciding to enter Maui, she wanted to sightsee. Built on volcanoes, this lone tourist had to be careful on its largest major island. With its mouth slowly drooling out 2100 degree hot fluorescent orange lava, Gia viewed it as spectacular. After this fantastic liquefying show, she decided to go back to her group. Taking her time, she flew very low above the ocean, enjoying its massive salty waves. Not knowing that the little tremor Gia felt back near the South Pole would lead to an underwater earthquake causing an aquatic earthly tsunami, this petrified leader saw it advancing towards her. Racing at 500 miles per hour, the 200-foot-high liquid wall of destruction roared closer and closer. Swallowing her up, this victim quickly emerged to the top of this tidal wave. Stalling out the motor, this first-time surfer had to quickly use her skateboard as a surfboard instead. Learning to balance on this killer wave, this novice surfer tried unsuccessfully to revive the drowned motor. Very fortunately, starting it on her third attempt, this heroine flew away very fast to warn these potential tsunami victims. Everyone fly to higher ground now! Gia screamed the loudest anyone had ever heard. Okay! okay. They all shouted in unison, then followed her, except for Ares. I'm leaving right now, Ares yelled obediently as the last one to depart due to a final repair. Following Gia's lead, trusting her with their lives, this escort safeguarded them all to the summit of Mauna Kea. Peaking at 16,000 feet above sea level, this world's third highest point provided safe harbor. Crashing through on the side of the mountain at a much lower altitude, the survivors horribly witnessed what this violent, watery phenomenon actually wiped out. Panting heavily for a few minutes, they all resumed their North Pole flight, 4,800 miles away. Finally reaching their last earthly destination, Zeus explained to the gang that Selene crash landed on this planet's moon. So with not much time to spare, he quickly positioned Gia to stand exactly on the North Pole. Knowing that our planet is tilted at 23.45 degrees, Zeus quickly estimated the direction and angle to locate the Copernicus crater to find Selene. At only 2,159 miles wide, our sole satellite moon is only one quarter the diameter of Earth. With its average distance of 238,855 miles away, Gia knew this would be a short flight. Locking all the visuals in her mind, this fearless commander mustered up all her troops, then headed out for this next very important adventure. Chapter 6 Darkened Lunar Moon Eclipse Taking off from the North Pole, flying only a short distance, they all had to slow down considerably to coincide with our moon's slow orbital velocity of only 745 miles per hour. Reaching this fifth largest satellite in our solar system, Gia quickly scanned its topography. Very quickly, eyeing all its 300,000 craters, having a minimum width of one kilometer, this keen team leader spotted the correct one. Celine, you're safe! Gia pouted as they all ran over to hug her. 
We all feared the worst. Aphrodite sobbed. Thankfully, you're all here to rescue me. I was so scared of all these gray craters, white powder, and everything else. Selene shuddered vigorously as they all consoled her affectionately. This place looks so scary and desolate. Uranus distressed. No way. This place would make a good skateboard park with all these craters and hill. Ares burst out with excitement. Okay, let's all stay put and allow the sun to recharge our batteries again, as they are all almost depleted. Gia ruled. Still amazed with its terrain, Ares ignored Gia's orders and sped off on his skateboard to Oceanus Procellarum. Covering one and a half million square miles, Ares stayed on a nearby section while performing his usual stunts. Meanwhile, back at Copernicus Crater, Selene noticed something very peculiar. Wow, look at that big shadow coming toward us. Selene panicked. Oh my, look at the planet we just exited moving in front of the yellow star. Aphrodite explained nervously as a total lunar eclipse began. Where's Ares? We all have to leave right now, Gia shouted forcefully. We can't see him. He flew over to that gray area. Uranus pointed firmly towards the general area. Panicking very much, Gia had to think clearly how to prepare for this darkened lunar eclipse. Tired of being coy and especially frightened, Selene knew this was the perfect time to break out of her shell and become brave. So with all the information she unconsciously gathered up while being stranded on our moon, this courageous one suddenly took charge. Wait a minute, Gia. Since the sandy substance on this surface is reflective from its regolith, I thought that if we all throw some of it up high, Ares might see it glowing and know it is us signaling him to come back here. Now, I know it seems like a long shot, but what have we got to lose? Selene mentioned with slight humor, yet very confidently. With Gia agreeing to Selene's fascinating idea, they all gladly participated in this very exciting, playful activity. Throwing this powdery substance as high as they possibly could, they all laughed and had a great time, forgetting all about their dire situation. Not even worried about getting it all in their hair and clothes, they continued having a blast with this child's play. Now only weighing one-sixth of your body weight on the moon compared to on Earth. These celebrants had the ability to jump extra high and perform forward and backwards flips, always in slower motion due to their lower weight. In the meantime, back on Oceanus Procellarum, while continuing his perilous maneuvers, this amazed daredevil was very fortunate to have seen this very spectacular light show. Unluckily having a premonition that this was a signal for him because something bad has happened, this worried one hurriedly raced off this dry ocean and regrouped with them. Wondering what the brilliant glowing performance was all about, they roughly explained it to Ares. Partially understanding this, they just stared at the sun in frozen horror, waiting to see what would happen next. Casting its first light shadow, known as Penumbra, they all started to panic. Hopping on their vehicles at the same time out of fear, Gia told them to be prepared to leave. Not having fully charged batteries, they only had about 20 seconds of power remaining, just as our Apollo rocket ship capsules had. Then suddenly, with the sun covering the entire bright side of the moon with its darkest shadow, known as the Umbra, they finally blasted off, straight up, very quickly while breathtakingly observing the blackened shadow Earth with its red solar ring edging its circumference. Taking a quick glance at the temporary red-colored moon from an angle, which can also be seen from Earth, they were flattered. Lasting only a little longer, these thrilled spectators gazed in awe as the total lunar eclipse transformed back to its penumbral stage. Lasting for only a few hours at a time, these shadowy shows certainly gave this audience quite an exciting, dramatic solar performance. So then, once again, this natural hydrogenous star fulfilled its mission again by refilling these customers' fuel tanks. 
Taking a well-deserved breather, Gia contacted Zeus again with another success story. Very pleased with the outcome, he needed a little more time to calculate for his next recovery job. Chapter 7 Desertic Martian Mars Tornado After reading their next instructions to rescue Poseidon, they all formally raced towards Mars. Colored red from its iron oxide, they were all amazed at its sight. While in flight, not seeing its ten-mile-wide outer moon, Deimos creeping towards them perpendicularly, it barely missed them all. Thinking nothing of this near miss, some looked back in awe at its amazing two craters, Voltaire and Jonathan Swift. Continuing their flight, they unfortunately flew into the orbital path of its other moon, Phobos, meaning fear. Panicking and getting nervous, they all instinctively turned right very hard. With this moon traveling at 4,800 miles per hour, they all braced themselves for yet another rough landing on its larger crater named Stickney. Frozen in terror, everyone huddled and shook vigorously for a while before regaining their composure. Is everybody okay? Gia quivered as they all replied yes while still shaken from this violent encounter. Oh no, this is it, we're doomed. Uranus complained as everyone else shook their heads in disagreement. Don't be so pessimistic, Selene informed Uranus with much confidence. We'll definitely find a way out. You're right, Selene, especially because we are all learning so much more about this part of the universe. Aphrodite optimized positively. Yeah, well, maybe we should just live here. It looks very entertaining. Ares gladly boasted as the rest gloated, thinking of that possibility. Okay, let's all just get a grip on reality and get ready to resume our mission, Gia instructed as they all prepared to depart. Indirectly scanning a last glimpse at this 17-mile-wide crater, they all resumed their flight. Only having to travel about 14,500 miles, they entered the fourth planet from the sun, which was easy to spot. At 370 miles wide and 14 miles tall, they were instructed to land at the summit of our solar system's largest mountain, named Olympus Mons. Okay now, Poseidon should be close by. Let's all look through our binoculars at a southwesterly direction to try to spot him, Gia instructed as these viewers observed. Wow, look at that vicious dust storm. I think it's coming towards us. Let's all run and hide. Uranus panicked as he shook uncontrollably at the nearby windstorm. Relax, Uranus. It's headed away from us in the other direction, Selene determined. Yes, don't worry. There's no need to fear, Aphrodite assured. Receiving an urgent email from Zeus that the rescuee was caught up in the aforementioned catabatic wind dust storm, Gia became very hesitant to send out a search party. So after indirectly seeing this message, without further hesitation, Ares felt the urgency to solely search for his friend. I must rescue him. He is in dire need, Ares insisted. No, wait for the winds to calm down, Gia shouted, but to deaf ears as Ares bolted towards his classmate's approximate locale. So bravely, but slowly trekking through this stormy catabatic wind, Ares soon had his pal in sight. Yelling his name, Poseidon only heard voices. Still delirious and suspicious due to his hard landing in this unfamiliar setting, he couldn't see through the whirling sand. Getting extremely nervous, especially from the voices getting closer, Poseidon darted out as fast as possible. Thinking that Ares could be mistaken as a Martian Mars creature, this petrified one never looked back speeding and veering on his vehicle through a maze-like, deep, steep-walled valley. Known as a labyrinthus, Ares was shadowing him, yelling and trying to calm down his neurotic mate. Abruptly exiting this maze, still very delirious, Poseidon flew north with Ares still tailing. Always observing through her binoculars, Gia had to find the right time to send the rest out for aid. 
So after the dust literally settled, she then ordered them to all help Ares give chase, including herself. Getting too nervous and too shaky to fly, Poseidon lost altitude very fast. Flying low and slow over the face of Mars, known as Sidomia, Poseidon got more scared than landed hard next to it. Taking a violent tumble, then rolling multiple times, these onlookers gasped in total disbelief. Holding his composure, Ares was the only one who knew what to do. Placing his hand over Poseidon's mouth and not feeling a breath, he tilted his head back. Blowing a few quick breaths into his mouth, he didn't feel him breathing. So quickly, pressing on his chest near his heart a few times, Poseidon finally came back to life. After a long applause from everybody else, this mission became another success. Chapter 8 Gigantic Jovian Jupiter Hurricane After telling Zeus about the success of their Martian encounter, he ordered Gia and her group to Ganymede for a meeting. Leaving the last of these inner planets, they used Jupiter as a guide. At 89,000 miles wide and 1,300 times larger than Earth, this first gaseous planet was always visible from Mars. Wow! What a beautiful planet! Aphrodite exclaimed with glee as they all approached this fifth planet from our sun. Still millions of miles away, they all stopped in mid-air to gaze at this picture-perfect giant. Although, due to its large size, this multi-toned peach-colored planet seemed to be standing still, even though it is our fastest rotating planet, spinning at 28,000 miles per hour. I don't know, this place looks big and evil. Uranus moaned, as usual, while Helios growled in disagreement. Actually, this place looks good enough to explore. I'm sure it has many intriguing geological features. Selene boasted. Well, it certainly is humongous. It must have a lot of places to ride on. Ares dreamt pleasantly. Okay, let's all resume our flight, Gia ordered reluctantly. Accidentally not remembering about this, and with Zeus forgetting to remind her, Gia inadvertently led her scouts into a large group of rocks known as the Asteroid Belt. Theorized that it was a planet nestled between Jupiter and Mars, then crushed up in Jovian Jupiter gravity, this party of seven soon was pelted by its small asteroids. So once again, this second cosmic collision sent them all into different directions again. Still out of control, Gia continued heading towards Jupiter. Spiraling repetitiously, this obligated one saw Uranus in the same dreadful situation, then tried catching up to him. Shockingly witnessing a lot of space objects being swallowed up by this planet's jelly-like surface, Gia then very quickly tugged his arm. Still twirling and approaching Jupiter's hurricane, known as the Great Red Spot, this superstar jumped into action. Uranus, I will try to push you away, Gia pointed out loudly while still hanging on to him. With both out of control, they headed towards the massive reddish-brown gigantic Jovian hurricane. Okay, just fling me at the right moment. Uranus insisted as they both grew dangerously closer to this five-mile-high phenomenon. Ares, grab Aphrodite, then veer away from it also! Gia firmly yelled. Okay, will do! Ares replied loudly, just before pulling her away from this 25,000-mile-wide natural disaster located 22 degrees south of its equator. So, just in the nick of time, using all her strength, Gia flung Uranus out of harm's way, back into space, while maneuvering her craft into position. Still out of control, she had to steer towards Ganymede to see Zeus. Tilting at the correct angle, the aerodynamic design of her craft steered Gia in the right direction. With Ganymede on the other side of Jupiter, she was traveling too slow. So getting too dangerously close to this planet, Gia entered its atmosphere to pick up speed, 
then slung shot 180 degrees around to actually land on Ganymede. Bigger than Pluto and Mercury, Gia entered the solar system's largest satellite. Entering its atmosphere, she had to tilt her scooter up to slow down, using its thick oxygen atmosphere. Becoming two and a half times heavier, which is the most on all of the planets, Gia had to brace herself. Crash landing, she tumbled a few times, unscathed. Witnessing all this from half a mile away, Zeus quickly ran over. Gia, are you all right? Zeus inquired loudly with much concern. Oh, yes, Gia replied as she walked off her slight pain. The others were just hit by a bunch of asteroids, sending them in all different directions, but no one was seriously injured. Gia explained very worriedly. I know I saw the collision on my computer monitor. I guess we did forget to warn them about it. Zeus admitted with much guilt. My scooter was damaged during the impact. It doesn't start up, Gia had to mention. No problem, we'll fix it. Zeus told her as he walked Gia and her scooter back to headquarters, where Cronus also comforted her. So after making minor repairs again, Zeus sent Gia to Callisto to rescue Ares. Discovered in 1610 by Italian astronomer Galileo, these kids were about to have some unforgettable heart-stopping moments on his four found satellites. Now entering this second largest Galilean satellite, she spotted Ares immediately due to Zeus's good directions. Not surprised seeing him skateboarding on its rock and ice surface, she comically attracted his attention. Oh, having fun are we now? Gia grinned with the supposedly serious look. <laughs> oh no, of course not. I was just waiting for backup to form a search party to find the others just like last time. Ares fibbed with slight guilt. Sending the good news about Ares' safety, Zeus gave Gia the pinpoints of Aphrodite's locale. Taking off together from this dark blue-gray moon, this duo soon reached Europa. Flying over its clear ice and brown, line-colored surface, they reached the Puel Crater. At only 15 miles wide, they had no problem finding Aphrodite on this bright white near feature. Aphrodite, you're safe! Gia brightly lit up as this trio embraced each other in a big group hug. Good to see you again! Ares added. You know what, guys? Aphrodite speculated. There could be primitive life forms under this ice. All the signs are there. Wow, you can be right. I understand how that can be. Ares thought with much amazement. That is a remarkable theory. Zeus and I never thought of that on our prior exploration here. We'll be sure to mention it to him the next time we see him. Gia stated firmly. Soon after contacting Zeus of Aphrodite's safety and discovery, he gave Gia the location of Selene and Poseidon. Now approaching towards this most inner Galilean satellite closest to Jupiter, chills ran down Gia's spine. Stopping and staring at it for a while, this trio, out of breath and with dreadful news, this couple started hyperventilating while trying to speak. Poseidon and I were just on that moon. Uranus is still there. He's in trouble, caught in a volcano. Selene yelled petrifyingly. Yes, it is important that we all rescue him now without further hesitation. Poseidon hyperventilated very rapidly. Okay, could you lead us to him? Gia asked sympathetically. We'll all follow you. We'll fly right behind you three. Aphrodite and Ares mentioned in sync with great apathy. Frighteningly entering this young surfaced satellite, Io, they had to fly only about 50 miles high so Selene could recognize the location. With sulfur and sulfur dioxide exploding up to 300 miles high, this quintet had to dodge many of its 400 active volcanoes. Understandably shaken, with their adrenaline flowing its fastest, this fourth-largest satellite in our solar system is also the most active place in our solar system. Reaching this Armageddon-like place, located on its equator and facing away from Jupiter, they very reluctantly entered into this 17-mile-wide volcano named Prometheus. 
meaning fire god. This extremely violent behemoth constantly blasts out boiling hot lava. Hypertensely pointing to where Uranus is holed up, Gia quickly gathered up her thoughts, then coordinated a plan. Yes, we can definitely squeeze in. Okay, everyone stay away from the fire and gather around. We must think up a plan to rescue Uranus. Gia cried while acknowledging this dire circumstance. First and foremost, we all must assess this urgent situation from all different angles, Poseidon pronounced with importance. Aphrodite and I could enter through the back way on our skateboards, avoiding the flames, Ares offered very humbly. Yes, we can definitely squeeze in that way, Aphrodite added carefully, due to prior experience with volcanoes. Actually, I think Ares and Aphrodite do have a good idea by entering through the back way, since the lava is flowing down in front of the volcano instead, Gia reminisced. Holding hands, they all formed a human chain, lowering each other for this daring mission with Gia as anchor and Aphrodite playing the rescuer. Uranus, give me your hand! Aphrodite demanded firmly as she stretched out her hand to his. I... I just can't quite reach it! Uranus stammered as his shaky hand just couldn't make contact with hers. Look out for the lava! Gia shrieked loudly just then as Uranus ducked with lava flowing right above him. Uranus, you must relax and grab her hand now, Ares instructed as he tried calming his neurotic one down. Woo, woo. Helios whimpered, trying to make sense of Uranus's predicament. Just inhale a few deep breaths to cure your hyperventilation, Poseidon medically advised. Okay. I think I can do it this time, Uranus anticipated as he grabbed his rescuer's hand confidently. Let's all pull ourselves up now, Gia dictated as she pulled them all to safety with the help of everyone else's assistance. Gathering together hastily right after this chilling encounter, they all briskly departed this 2,300-mile-wide moon. Finally, after telling him about this apocalyptic-like adventure, Zeus let them all take a long break until their next big adventure. Chapter 9 Ringed Saturnian Saturn Pursuit Now, secretly looking at his UPS, Zeus and Gia spotted Hades on Saturn's largest moon, named Titan. Feeling very horrified, they remembered how dangerous our solar system's second largest moon is because of its atmospheric methane gas. Meanwhile, accidentally eavesdropping on them while Zeus and Gia were conjuring up a plan, Cronus overheard the dreadful news. Now feeling very fortunate that she wasn't injured at all during the asteroid belt collision, Cronus wanted to pay it forward. Running up to take a swift glance at Hades' proximity, Cronus rapidly set off on a solo mission to search for her acquaintance. Sensing her dangerous intention, Zeus objected to it. Come back, it's much too dangerous! Zeus yelled frantically without much luck. We have to devise a safe rescue plan first! Gia also shouted to her, but to no avail. I must save her! Cronus screamed back with great apathy while flying further and further away. I have to fly out and stop her. Is anyone going to help me? Gia inquired desperately as she instantly took off. I will, Ares answered boldly as he caught up to her, joining in the chase. Soon approaching this sixth planet from the sun, Cronus went searching for this light tan moon. Using this second-largest planet as a landmark, she flew just above its innermost ring, using it as a guide. Unbeknownst to her, Gia and Ares flew right behind, trying to discourage her. Advancing towards its rings, these daredevils would soon fly very fast, just above their surfaces, made up of broken rocks and ice. Now, with all of them flying on its innermost one, named the D-Ring, Gia and Ares turned out left onto the sea ring. Closing in, they wanted to stop this madness. Realizing they are right behind her, she pulled further out to the B ring, with the two still trailing. 
trying to shake them off, Cronus sped up and pulled further out left into the Cassini division, which is spaced in between the A ring and B ring. Suddenly, with Cronus diving low and slowing down, this duo passed by her. Reappearing, then resuming regular speed, the chase then veered left onto the A ring. Seeing her in their rear view mirror, they slowed down severely to let Cronus pass. Not worried at all, Cronus then swerved left onto the Inca division. With her nemesis still in hot pursuit, she turned left further from this planet onto its F ring. Hooking more westward, entering its G ring, this time her opponents advanced to her port side. Narrowly avoiding the moon, Mimus, which was right in front of her, Cronus abruptly executed a hard left turn, inadvertently sideswiping these two aggressive chasers. Out of control, they all ended up on its E ring. Heading towards Enceladus, they all bounced off the moon's atmosphere. Knocked out of Saturn's rings, they all deflected towards different directions. Effortlessly glancing at its other major moons, Tethys, Dione, Rhea, and Iapetus, Cronus finally spotted its most major moon, Titan. Still out of control, Cronus managed to change course towards her desired location. Meanwhile, after gaining control and heading back, these two sad ones had to tell Zeus the bad news that they thought Cronus probably didn't make it after entering Titan's toxic methane atmosphere. Fearing the worst, this captain needed some alone time to regrip his composure. Thinking up another brilliant plan, Zeus needed two or more rescuers. So volunteering immediately, Hermes and Poseidon snapped to attention, hopped on their scooters and sped away. Pedaling as fast as he could, Hermes told his passenger that he will definitely rescue Cronus and Hades. Hold on tight now, Helios, Hermes insisted as the young Dalmatian barked repeatedly in compliance with his order. Okay now, Hermes, perhaps we should considerably decrease our acceleration, for we are rapidly advancing towards the designation, Poseidon strongly advised. Not being able to slow down fast enough and approaching at too slight of an angle, they deflected off of Titan's thick atmosphere, knocking them both out of control. Gaining back control right away, Poseidon grew very frightened. Returning to headquarters, he told Zeus and Gia that he didn't know anything about the whereabouts of Hermes and Helios after his deflection. At the same time, on Titan, Cronus did manage to land safely on Arrakis Planitia. At 210 miles wide, this plane, Planitia, was very flat. Always appearing to be very dark on this moon's surface, Cronus had to turn on her vehicle's headlight. Panning her eyes left to right, this amazed one observed inactive volcanoes, hills, flat areas, lakes, rivers, and seas of liquid methane. Instinctively catching her peripheral vision, this vigilant seeker snapped her head right. Fortunately, because of the total darkness, she was able to see a blinking light from 50 miles away. Having a deja vu moment, she thought it was recognizable. More than curious, this suspicious looker darted across the terrain on her scooter in a flash. Hades, stay there! It's me, Cronus! She yelled, then exited her vehicle and ran towards her. Oh no, I think I'm hearing voices. What is that coming towards me? Hades imagined out loud, nightmarishly, as she ran away while in a delusional state of mind. Stop! Wait a minute! Cronus demanded just before they both ran, then tripped down a small crater unscathed. Oh, it's you! Hades cried with relief. You are so athletic for navigating through this very flammable and treacherous place. You truly are my hero! Hades proclaimed appreciatively as they both chuckled for a while, then embraced. Now relaxing for a moment in the stillness of this night, thinking they were free from danger, the methane-composed clouds right above them suddenly wrung out its contents. Pouring out methane gas, this unfortunate pair became drenched in toxicity. Hades, we should fly off this place right away! Cronus bemoaned, then both ran to their scooters very fast. 
Mine won't start, Hades blurted out just after her headlight dimmed low, wearing down the battery. Darn, mine won't start either, Cronus feared as she continuously tried starting it up while the lights flickered. Okay, now I think that I only have enough power for one more try. Cronus distressed before it did start on her last try. So just like a spaceship capsule with a booster rocket that just has enough power to launch, Cronus catapulted out with her client in tow. Still being doused in methane, its gas leaked onto her scooter's electrical system. Soon igniting, this flammable liquid covered part of Cronus's scooter with fire. With Titan's oxygenated atmosphere fueling it, the flame spread to Hades's. Both yelling and screaming, Cronus couldn't speed up any faster. Finally exiting its atmosphere, fortunately, the flames extinguished itself due to the lack of oxygen in space. Experiencing a very traumatic event, Cronus then flew straight back to headquarters with Hades still in tow. Defending her insubordination to Gia, all was forgiven. Calculating a new plan, Zeus still had to have Hermes and Helios rescued. Chapter 10 Tilted Uranian Uranus Amazement After Gia explained to Zeus about Hermes's and Helios's direction and estimated speed they were traveling after bouncing off Titan, Zeus had to estimate abstractly due to his UPS fading out suddenly. Solving all of these arithmetic problems in his head, this born leader came up with the solution to their approximate locale. Knowing that when an object is projected into space, Zeus knew that it usually maintains its current speed and direction. So now, with all these equations deciphered, this mathematician determined that most likely Hermes and Helios were headed towards Pluto. Getting packed up in a hurry, they all left together as a group to find their lost companions. Taking one step at a time, Zeus thought it would be best if they flew to Uranus and land on its largest moon, Titania, to visually observe Pluto's location. Okay, let's all slow down. This is a very dangerous area, Zeus cautioned as they approached the outer section of Uranus's 13 rings. Wow, this planet is so fascinating, Selene gasped as she was amazed by its gleaming light bluish green color of this seventh planet from the sun. Please pay attention to where you are flying. You may hit something, Uranus predicted as Selene kept staring while heading towards the E-ring. Reflecting two-thirds of all these rings' total light, this outermost one of its nine major rings was in their flight path's trajectory. Watch out, Selene! Look where you are going! Uranus warned frantically as she desperately swerved to avoid hitting the moon, Cordelia, which is located right on the E-ring. Whoa, I am out of control. Please help me, someone. Celine begged as she flew above the E-ring counterclockwise while swerving right, just missing the other moon, Ophelia, which is located on that ring's other side. She flew out of control here. Everyone follow me so we can find her. Zeus ordered as everybody else followed him. Incoming! Watch out, everybody! Gia yelled, then all veered in different directions to avoid hitting this sought-after moon. Well, I turned out of its way just in time! Aphrodite exclaimed as she was the last to avoid this 980-mile-wide, Uranus's only retrograde orbiting satellite, preventing a Titanian-Titania collision. Selene executed a hard right at about 15 degrees, Poseidon determined. Maybe if I pedal faster, I could pull her to a stop, Cronus explained as they all tried their best to help Selene. Successfully dodging its outer major moons, Oberon, Titania, Umbriel, and Ariel, they flew towards the innermost major moon named Miranda. Being the first one to enter its atmosphere, Selene had to make an emergency landing. I'll try to cut her off safely, Ares yelled to all. Too late. I just saw Selene land hard over there, near that bright V feature, 
Ares told all before they flew past, landing close by on this 300-mile-wide, smallest major satellite. We must all now devise a rescue plan with precision, Hades suggested. Riding on its very rough and coarse terrain, they all had to travel very slowly, especially to avoid falling into its fractured, shadowy canyons, which are up to 12 miles deep. Picking up the pace, they all recklessly yet unintentionally cut each other off, wanting to individually take credit for Celine's rescue. Finally reaching this V-shaped chevron, they all expressed confusion while visually scanning this 2,000-foot-wide landmark for any signs of their victim. Although arriving here in last place, Uranus knew he could still prevail by staying vigilant. Trying to drop his cowardice, this dedicated one used all his astrophysical knowledge to detect any scientific proof of Selene's presence. So staring at the V for a while, this amateur detective started getting chills. Slowly scrolling down the indent with his eyes, he followed where the letter was pointing to. Looking about 20 degrees west, this suspicious one got an eerie feeling. With his heart beating very fast, he then proceeded to the Alonso crater very rapidly in a mesmerized state of mind. Baffled by Uranus's odd behavior, all the others secretly followed this suspicious one out afar. After quietly trailing this spied upon one for about 50 miles, these pursuers became less skeptic than congregated around him at the 15-mile wide hole. With Uranus shockingly pointing at Celine's scooter, premonition came true, traumatizing everyone. Okay, everyone, let's all rescue Celine. Uranus officiated as he informally took charge. Let's grab some rope and look down this crater, Aphrodite added as they prepared for their task. There she is! Cronus pointed out and yelled after hearing this martyr's cry for help. Everyone follow me! Uranus demanded as they ran behind him a quarter mile to the rescue site. Everyone hold on to the rope! Uranus instructed as he tied it around his waist, then lowered himself down to save her. Hurry up, Uranus! The rope is breaking! Zeus warned loudly as its sharp rocks were cutting through this swaying rope. Grab onto me, Selene! Uranus belted out as everyone else continued gripping the weakening cord with all their strength. I got you now! Selene expressed after jumping off her ledge, then grabbing tightly onto her savior for dear life. I'll get us out of here in a second. Her hero promised this helpless one as they still pivoted like a clock's pendulum. Hurry, please, it's about to snap. Gia blared as the sharp ridge stones continued splicing through the line's final few strands very rapidly. Come on, you can do it. Aphrodite cheered them both on. Uranus, perhaps if you both swayed your body side to side more vigorously, it shall pick up the momentum, Poseidon theorized. So with only seconds left, this brave one gave one last swing. Just as the rope snapped, these two near fatalities flung up. Landing on its surface with minimal small cuts and bruises, they were both lucky to have survived. Spending a small amount of time to recover, they were ready to depart for Titania, which was their original designation. Once there, they all settled. Chapter 11 Ultraviolet Neptunian Neptune Fascination With his UPS permanently broken, Zeus asked everyone to try to locate the small dwarf planet that scientists say may just be an asteroid known as Pluto, with their binoculars. Knowing that Hermes and Helios's is probably already on Pluto, Zeus estimated that planet asteroid should be close by in sequential order. I just discovered its proximity, Poseidon bragged after quickly estimating its juxtaposition, then by following its projected orbital path with his eyes. Wow, that's amazing, 
Zeus confessed to Poseidon as he slowly put down his binoculars disappointingly, with everyone else imitating. Good eyes, Poseidon. You didn't even use your binoculars. That planet is hundreds of millions of miles away from here. Gia complimented impressively. Okay, perhaps it's best if we resume our search. Every minute counts. Poseidon officiated. Giving him credit for his find, Zeus bent the rules just this once by allowing Poseidon to lead the way. Feeling very privileged and authoritative, this temporary escort guided the way without incident. Approaching the eighth planet from the sun, known as Neptune, all these astonished ones stopped and were amazed by its ultraviolet blue glow. Still hypnotized by its fluorescent color, Gia unconsciously drifted towards danger. Known as the Great Dark Spot, they had to be very careful of this counterclockwise rotating cyclone, which produced winds of up to 1,500 miles per hour. Indirectly heading very fast towards this 8,100-mile-wide storm, Gia panicked, lost control and concentration. Gia, veer away from that hurricane! Poseidon hollered as he raced towards her. I'm trying to! Gia hyperventilated while frantically trying to regain control. Turn! 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 Everybody else shouted repeatedly. Just relax and calm down, Poseidon advised as he tried unsuccessfully to nudge her away from danger. I'm right behind you, pal. I'll try to grab her. Uranus revealed to Poseidon, but without success. Being the most similar planet to ours in the fact that you would only weigh one-sixth more on its surface, the smallest of the gaseous planet's gravity pulled them in only at an average speed. I now have possession of you, Gia, Poseidon told as he heroically grabbed her right handlebar while Uranus boldly grabbed her left one. Finally pulling her to safety, they all then resumed their flight. Let's all land on this giant moon, Poseidon directed as he pointed to a large satellite which was at its average distance of 220,000 miles from its planet. Dodging while passively observing most of its 13 moons, they prepared to land on this Neptunian Neptune moon. Now not realizing that this satellite is Neptune's only retrograde orbiting moon, they all underestimated its incoming speed and had to swerve out of the way. Turning back very swiftly, they all had to coincide with its slow velocity of only 2,200 miles per hour to land on it. So, with all setting up their observation in the middle of this 1,680-mile-wide moon, Poseidon had to take one last look at Pluto through his binoculars to evaluate the most precise way to approach that trailing planet. Losing his train of thought, this intelligent one started to get nervous. Picking up on this, Zeus silently took back command. Trying desperately to spark up his UPS once again, which was on the blink, it finally shut itself down permanently. Chapter 12 Icy Plutonian Pluto Avalanche. Flying very fast for over a billion miles so far, they safely arrived close to this ninth and final planet slash asteroid from the sun. Slowing down substantially, they cautiously headed towards our smallest planet slash asteroid. True to Hades's premonition, this approximate 100-mile-wide outermost moon, named Hydra, roared in front of them, nearly causing another collision. With only 13,000 more miles to reach their destination, they had to carefully dodge its remaining three moons. P4, Nix, and Karen. Realizing from past estimations that the planets have a slower orbital velocity the further they are away from its sun, she advised them to approach even slower. Finally arriving very safely, Hades decided to have them head towards the north section of this coldest planet. Revolving at only 10,500 miles per hour, this slowest orbiting planet had to be approached very carefully. Slowing down, they all touched ground and slid safely on this icy, Hadean, Plutonian surface 
amusing everyone. I think we should explore this planet slash asteroid individually to find Hermes and Helios. Then meet back here periodically with updates. Hades strongly suggested. I do presume that shall be the most elaborate plan. Poseidon pronounced. I concur, Gia added. Sounds like a good idea, Zeus opined. Knowing what they had to do, these venturers set out. Flying solo each, they flew low, slow, and vigilantly. At only one one-fiftieth of the volume of Earth, these seekers thought it would be an easy job. In a short while, seeing Hades flying over, Helios barked profusely. Realizing what his dog was doing, Hermes quickly threw up ice in front of Hades to capture her attention. Seeing this, she approached them, yelling at her not to land because of their dire situation that he and Helios were in. She told them she'd go back and get everyone else to help out. So meeting back at their agreed time and location, Hades told them all about her find. Closely following this locator, they all then gathered around these helpless ones. My foot is stuck in this ice. Everyone stay away. The ice above me is chipping. It may start an avalanche. Hermes warned as it started breaking more and more, causing an avalanche. Crashing down, tons of ice slid in a massive landslide. Running for their lives, the others barely escaped a certain demise. Buried in some of this, their rescuers had to devise a plan. Seeing them still conscious, Hades came up with a brilliant idea. Help! Helios and I are stuck in this ice! Hermes repeated. Don't worry, you two. Stay still. I have a plan. Hades disclosed. While carving out a cubic foot of ice, Hades asked everyone to soften it up into the shape of a concave lens. Using their bare hands, they molded the frozen water. Finishing it, they aimed this primitive magnifier between the sun and the ice that was holding them trapped. Softening it up slowly, these trapped ones freed themselves. So finally, with this whole group congregating together for the first time since the Halley's Comet collision, the rescue mission certainly seemed to have come to a conclusion. Now, after having a celebratory mini-reunion, these cheerful classmates knew they had to get back to serious business. Being at its aphelion, furthest distance from the sun, this planet was almost 4.6 billion miles away. Having a bad feeling that it was so far away, appearing so tiny. Hades feared that most likely there would be a solar eclipse when a planet's moon orbits in front of its sun. Even though all their batteries weren't too low, this still reigning boss suggested they hop into Karen to fully recharge them. Cruising over only 12,000 miles, they completed that duty on the sunny side of this 750-mile-wide satellite. So after that simple assignment, Zeus and Gia had a very important speech to orate. It is really good that we are all finally back together again after all these search and rescue missions. Zeus gloated with much gratitude. Yes, our mission is now complete, Gia officially confirmed. We would like to thank you all for participating in this project, but especially for your bravery by rescuing each other. Zeus appreciated with gratitude. Okay, we will now be heading over to the Red Planet for band practice. I chose that place randomly, Gia informed joyfully as her apprentices bursted out in cheer. Immediately packing up, then taking off, these happy artists were very excited. Still very proud of her, Zeus once again allowed Hades to guide them all to Mars. Performing their music, singing, and playing their instruments, they had hours of fun with this much-deserved entertainment. Unfortunately, coming to a closing, this social event concluded. Knowing that all good times come to an end, these musicians knew they had to carry on. Taking back their command, Zeus and Gia escorted these socialites back to the old headquarters at our North Pole. Because his UPS wasn't working, 
this brilliant astrophysicist had to look up to the stars to navigate his way back home. Known as celestial navigation, this stargazer started to observe the night sky. Looking straight up, Zeus used the Big Dipper as a landmark. Following the last two stars, pointers, from its pot, this intelligent cosmologist followed it up about 34 degrees with his eyes. Viewing this with amazement, Zeus felt that everybody will finally be brought back home safely. Almost forgetting, he had to readjust his scholar's governors to exceed light speed. So after a very long and dangerous adventure, they all packed up one last time, then finally left this very mysterious solar system and flew back home. Chapter 13 Ceremonial Planetary Planets Dedications Feeling very relieved from the dangers left behind them, they felt safe. Traveling faster than the speed of light, these braggarts exaggerated about their recent adventures. I will definitely tell the superiors about our new findings on this recently discovered solar system, Zeus promised them all. Yes, and you all were very obedient and tried your best as a group, Gia praised. I'm going to tell all the school kids about the neat places we went to, especially the cool ones for skateboarding. Ares raved proudly. This trip was so much fun, yet a little messy, but I'm going to tell them about how much fun we had. Aphrodite glowed slightly. Luckily, we all mostly put on a courageous act. Uranus braved. I know, especially when it became very scary out there. Selene laughed. Maybe the best part of this probe was its physical fitness. Hermes exercised verbally. Definitely, it was also a very well cardiovascular routine. Cronus emulated alike. Apparently, this reconnaissance mission should be acknowledged by its astrophysical facts and figures. Poseidon conceived specifically. But of course, and also from our own hypotheses and conclusions, Hades completed as Helios barked with longevity, agreeing with everyone's comments. Slowing down, they were almost home. Maneuvering around its outer moon, Polaris B, then by its inner moon, Polaris AB, they arrived at the Cepheid variable star they call home. Entering the inside where they live, they were homesick, so they all rushed to their families. Hearing of their safe arrival, their leader soon set up a function in their honor at their school's auditorium with many in attendance. Honorees, distinguished guests, parents, and students, it is my privilege to honor these ten adventurous, very brave students and a courageous Dalmatian puppy for their great accomplishments for having discovered, explored, and examined a new solar system in our Milky Way galaxy. It is with great distinction that I now award them. All you honorees may now come forward to receive your trophies. This honorer instructed. Lining up on stage in specific order with their backs toward the audience, facing King Zeus, they all stood and waited patiently while still very excited. Walking over towards his first dedicatee, this dedicator had a big grin on his face. Laughing hysterically with Helios, everyone thought it was so hilarious to present a dog with such an award. Still very amused, King Zeus gave his dedication while holding the trophy in honor of his first recipient. Trying to hold their laugh, they all still heard the king's speech. Helios, my loyal pet, I proudly present to you this trophy for your courage by saving Aphrodite from that burning yellow star. I now give it the name Sun, named after you. This dedicator honored humorously. Roof, roof. Helios barked loudly as to accept this honor with pride. While everyone else continued laughing hysterically, then cheering for this fearless pup as the king moved right to his next recipient. Hermes, for using your athleticism, 
especially to save your own sister, Cronus. I now name that first planet from its son, Mercury, in honor of you. This ruler nobly devoted. Thank you, sir. I am honored. I work on physical fitness every day. Hermes admitted. Good afternoon, honey. The king kindly greeted her. I named the next planet, Venus, after you, for putting down your vanity, getting down and dirty while studying that second planet, but especially for saving all the others from its volcano. Congratulations, young lady. Thank you, king. That has taught me to put down my narcissism and to humble myself when needed, Aphrodite admitted. Sliding to his right again, as for every awardee, this officiator commended his next receiver. As for you, Gia, for studying that solar system's third planet from its sun, taking charge of its rescue by helping Aphrodite to save Uranus in the sinking sand, and by saving Ares, Aphrodite, and again Uranus from that tidal wave, I named that third aquatic planet, Earth, after you. I am so proud of you, Gia, my daughter. Her dad delighted as he teared up and gave his only daughter a very tight embrace. Thank you, Father. I always try to make you proud of me. Gia sobbed. Ares, you former vain student, it is my privilege to name this fourth planet, Mars, in honor of you for also dropping your arrogance and saving Poseidon by performing CPR, regardless of your own personal safety. The king declared, I am deeply honored, sir. Ares humbled, short and to the point, as this king resumed his commitment. Zeus, what can I say? Despite your imperfect mission, you are being congratulated with your great discovery. Leadership teachings, and heroism. This dedication is by far the greatest honor in my life. It is absolutely my privilege to personally present you with this magnificent trophy and to name its largest planet, Jupiter, in honor of you, my son. King Zeus delivered with much pride and joy. I am deeply honored yet humbled. I also try my best to please you, father. Zeus's only son whimpered as he held tightly onto his trophy with pride, then gave a firm handshake to his dad. After interacting a little longer, he knew it was time to move this mission along. Cronus, our most physically fit female student, for your athletic skills in saving Hades, I now name its sixth planet, Saturn, after you. His majesty dedicated to her with great pride. With much appreciation, it is my greatest privilege to receive such an award. Cronus praised. Uranus, you have certainly come a long way by deleting your pessimism and cowardice. You proved your courage to us all. So for that, and by saving Selene on the seventh planet, I now name it Uranus, in honor of your bravery. This leader proudly quoted. I do accept this award with great pride, my king. Uranus welcomed as his greatest achievement to date. Good afternoon, Poseidon. As our most intelligent male fifth grade student, you have proved your astronomical knowledge, partly by locating that luminous planet, taking charge of its rescue mission, and by saving Gia. So for all that, I definitely choose to name the eighth planet, Neptune after you. Their king declared, With much acknowledgement, one must be commemorated and aggrandized. Poseidon certified modestly. And last, but not least, as our school's most intelligent fifth grade female student, you have demonstrated your wisdom by influentially taking charge, pinpointing its last and smallest planet from far away, then by making a primitive yet sophisticated instrument to save Hermes and my puppy, Helios, who were trapped in an avalanche. So for all that, I definitely name your planet Pluto. This monarch validated. 
unpretentiously and demurely, I am extremely gratified, Your Highness. Hades complimented. Now concluding these dedications, King Zeus ended it with a short speech. Having these awardees turn around, the audience rose and gave them a long chanting standing ovation as all these recipients held their trophies over their heads while cheering loudly. Still very excited, all these characters, whose names coincide with Greek mythological gods and goddesses, were truly honored to have their dedications named after them. So later on that day, they all had their own little celebration. That dedication was so awesome. We were all wicked excited. Aphrodite cheered. Yeah, it was so cool. That was a fantastic jubilee. Ares expressed with much glee. Do you think that maybe next year we could escort the next fifth grade class to explore that solar system? Cronus questioned everyone. Well, that seems very possible. We should first make sure that they are all in good physical shape, Hermes suggested. We all could definitely guide those students, Selene guaranteed. We also have to make sure they don't panic or fear anything, Uranus thought. Theoretically, most of its data and figures were calculated correctly to guarantee accurate instruction, Hades factualized. Although, hypothetically, much of its evidence is merely speculative. Poseidon clarified, but you have confidence that it would still be a safe venture. Our king will definitely permit us to chaperone our underclassmates to explore that solar system, because we proved that we could explore and study it, then come back safely, Gia attested. Yes, you are all correct. I think the most important thing about our mission was that no one was seriously injured. We all helped each other, rescued us all when we needed, and worked together as a group to study, examine, and explore that solar system. We were all thankful for being congratulated by our superiors, teachers, students, and classmates. Gia and I would like to especially thank all of you eight astronomy classmates very much for your eager participation. Zeus deeply praised with much empathy as they all hurried to give an emotional group hug. So, a little while later, given permission in the future to guide and explore, Zeus and this group often escorted future fifth-grade astronomy students to our solar system and other locations of the universe. Continuing their frequent space travels, they all learned how important exploration really is. This has been Star Kids Solar System Exploration. Written by John Harrington. Narrated by Stephanie Quinn. Copyright 2011 by John Harrington. Production copyright 2018 by John Harrington.